take a look at it. And I just tried to chew in around the doors. And you could see a dog print, you know, alongside the window there. And so the officer and I went out there to uh, take a look at it. And, you know, he's tried to chew in around the door and you can see a dog print outside on the the window there. You know, it's obviously a dog. A very strange thing happened after the poem was aired. Somewhere in the northern woods darkness, a creature walks upright, and the best advice you may ever get is to never go out at night. A very strange thing happened after the poem was aired on the radio on April 1st, 1987, and it became obvious the story was not going to fade away. The first two times the song was played, there was no viewer reaction or calls. Cook and O'Malley were prepared to let the failed prank die, when the phone lines started lighting up. People were calling in asking about that weird song. Listeners asked, who did that song on that dogman thing? And when are you going to play it again? O'Malley took a call from an elderly man who stated that he was chilled to the bone after hearing the song because he had actually seen a similar creature years before. That was the first of many sighting reports that would pour into the station over the next few weeks. Scores of people told of stories and encounters with a creature that was very much like Cook's fabricated dogman. In one month, The Legend of the Dogman became the most requested song on the air, and for a short time, was added into the regular rotation of the music. Other stories began to surface and become compared to the Michigan Dogman story. A century-old, mysterious Indian legend revealed shocking similarities. A French fur trader's diary from 1804 told of an encounter with a beast. A letter from 1857 described a creature that stood upright like a man, yet bore the countenance of a gray wolf. A real dogman sighting investigated by Lake County Sheriff Deputy Jeff Chamberlain, who was accompanied by a Department of National Resources Officer Ron McCarty, was picked up and reported on by Mark Moretti, a reporter for the Cadillac Evening News. Then other news outlets picked up on the story and it was later fed down the Associate Press newswire and thus was picked up by newspapers all across America. He was even mentioned as a strange coincidence in Paul Harvey's national news and comments broadcast. McCarty called the TV station WTCM, stating that he and Chamberlain had only joked about how their sighting would fit in with the seventh year prophecy made in the song. McCarty's voice would later appear in the beginning of the 10th anniversary version of the song, The Legend 97. Suddenly, The Legend soared into national prominence and became a hit song once again, only this time on a much larger scale. Requests for copies came in from all 50 states and around the world. Eventually, the master tape, never considered to be of real value, had been destroyed, and Stephen Cook went into the studio again, this time with an upgraded keyboard, and recorded the song a second time. A few changes were made to the lyrics to update the legend for summer, and when it was finished, the second master recording was shipped to Southernfield, Michigan for mass production. The first 500 copies arrived a week later, and sold out in 12 days. The legend had quickly become a hot property with record stores and record stations across the country calling the station requesting copies. A large recording company offered to record and promote the song, and Steve Cook faced a difficult decision of whether to release the legend on a national scale or keep it local and manageable. Steve chose to keep it local. The music and lyrics were copyrighted by Mindstage Productions, Steve's marketing and advertising company. More and more copies of the tape, which was originally priced at $3, were sold, and in the fall of 1987, WTCM held an art contest which allowed amateur artists the chance to submit works depicting what they thought the dogman looked like. There were over a hundred entries. Some were exceptional. But by far the most chilling and dramatic was an 11 by 17 charcoal sketch done by Brian Rosinski who was only 23 years old at the time and never had a formal art lesson. The song was never intended to be a marketable vehicle of profit, and Cook made the decision early on that any profits earned derived from its sales would be donated to charity. The first charity was the Traverse City Cherryland Humane Society, which scored 
$2,500 towards drilling a new water well and the remodeling of the adult dog facility, which included new floor tile and pens. In 2001, Cook was introduced to Brian Manley, former owner of AC Paw, a no-kill animal shelter program that specialized in lost cases. AC Paw takes in animals that had been injured, abused, or neglected, or that had used up the maximum boarding time in traditional facilities and had to be euthanized. AC Paw takes in animals that have been injured, abused, or neglected, or that had used up the maximum boarding time in traditional facilities and are about to be euthanized. They rehabilitate animals through a unique foster care network and eventually place them into loving homes. Cook was impressed with the AC Paw program. He shifted all donations from the proceeds of the legend to their cause and thus the legend of the dog man's legacy lives on for animals in need. While the legend has never been formally distributed for airplay on other radio stations, it's been heard across the U.S. and the world. Many young adults grow up hearing it and remember it scaring them at summer campfire storytelling sessions. The legend has inspired movie screenplays, stage productions, numerous books, term papers, at least one master's thesis, and countless classroom projects. In spite of the initial belief that the song would be a radio bit designed to run one day only, interest in the legend continues to grow. Steve Cook receives 10 to 20 reported sightings each year, many supported by dramatic evidence. Perhaps the best description of the legacy of the legend came from WTCM's morning host Jack O'Malley. The song has been firmly woven into the fabric of northern Michigan. It's part of the culture now, part of the folklore. The legend will be here long after we're gone. Big Rapids, 1961. When I was a boy, my father was the night watchman at a manufacturing plant located in the rural areas between Big Rapids and Shapiro Lake. Our house, which, if I remember right, was a perk of the night watchman's job, was across the street from the factory. The plant building was right next to a large wilderness area of state land. At that time, it was simply known as Haymarsh. Now it's officially called Haymarsh State Game Area. We didn't understand it at the time, but my dad was always very skittish about letting us play outside after dark. Sometimes talk about how You'd hear coyotes or bears roaming around the Haymarsh. He was walking with the perimeter of the building at night. But one night in the summer of 1961, Dad walked back to the house to sit on the porch and have a cup of coffee and sweet roll. He had a good view of the entire plant property. Saw some movement near a chain-link fence behind the building. This was appropriately... This was approximately 3 a.m. He felt quite sure this person wasn't there by accident. He drew his gun and he watched for a few minutes. That's when he noticed this was not a person at all. Something much taller. He said it appeared to be covered in brown-gray fur. It had very broad shoulders and a powerful chest. It alternated between walking on all fours and standing up on two. He said it, it seemed to be looking for something along this driveway. He said later he couldn't quite believe what he was seeing. He quietly moved into the house and grabbed the Kodak Signet 35mm camera, which was his pride and joy. Now, at this point, I should mention that Dad was quite a photography buff. His father had owned one of the first camera stores in Ohio. Dad got this shutterbug from Grandpa. Well, as he stepped back onto the porch, the creature moved slowly along the driveway, directly onto the lights. He adjusted the camera shutter for a long exposure, held it as still as he could. He said that he had pretty bad shakes by then. He snapped a picture. Now I put the picture along with his letter. Dad said a few seconds later the thing dropped back onto all fours and slowly moved off into the woods. He sent a print to the local newspaper, sent copies to several magazines. One, I think, was called Mysterion, published the photo in the spring issue of 1962. Dad had a copy of the magazine for years, but it was misplaced after he passed away. I still have the negative strip that contains this image. We'd like to have someone examine it. I also still have Dad's Kodak Signet. I haven't shot any pictures with it for several years, but I'm pretty sure. Pretty sure it still works. 
Sparta, 1978. One weekend back around fall of 1978, my two best friends and I were staying at a family's cabin, which is not far away from the small town of Sparta, about 20 minutes north of Grand Rapids. My two friends left to have dinner while I stayed behind at the cabin. Following the dinner, the men headed back towards Sparta and the cabin. What happened next shock and disturb them for years. It was dark, and they were on a rural road. Suddenly, both of them saw something standing out on the side of the road. In the headlights of the car, it appeared to be a human-like figure covered in gray fur. As they get closer and pass the figure, both of them get a very good look at it. It was the size of a man, stood on two legs. It was covered head to toe in gray fur and had this wolf-like face. It even raised its hands and seemed to snarl at them as they drove by. They said it looked like a werewolf out of a Hollywood movie. My two friends didn't stop. They continued driving, and of course, they were peppering each other with questions. Do you see that too? Was that a dog? Was that someone dressed in a costume? And so on. As they are having this animated conversation, they pass by the signs that say, Welcome to Sparta and drove through the small main street and continued on out of the town in the direction of my cabin. Their conversation about what had just happened continued when both of them looked up to see that same Welcome to Sparta sign again, followed by the same main street that they had just driven through only moments ago. They hadn't stopped or turned around. They had been traveling in the same direction on the same road, but somehow without any noticeable interruptions in their journey, they somehow had been sent backwards several miles. I remember when they finally showed up in my cabin. They arrived no later than what I had expected them to. Around maybe 9 p.m. or so. And I remember how animated they were about this strange encounter, but I just assumed they had seen a large dog or they were telling me an embellished story in order to get a laugh. But 20 minutes later, both of them insisted that this was no joke. I have no idea what to make of this story. Maybe it was just some teenagers in a werewolf costume playing pranks. And did my friends really experience lost time afterwards? Or did they just make some wrong turns on their drive and didn't notice because they were talking and distracted? I have no idea. But I would love to know if anybody else has seen something similar in the Sparta area. Reed City, 1993. The area around Reed City, Michigan has been a hotbed for dogman activity. This report details an event that occurred nearly 20 years ago, but the witness remembers it like it was yesterday, and is unshaken in her story. Her name is Courtney, and her encounter took place during the winter of 1993 to 1994. Courtney was a teenager at the time, and was sneaking cigarettes behind her parents' house near Todd Lake. The sun was setting on a clear, cold winter day. Courtney was facing a large abandoned barn on the property next door. The barn had always kind of spoke to me. It was filled with rusty old equipment. The outer planks were all rotten and it sagged and leaned in every direction. My dad said to stay away as the whole thing could collapse. On that evening, I was standing about 15 feet from the barn and saw sunlight coming through the gaps in the siding. Courtney took her eyes off the barn for a few minutes. Then something caught her attention. There was some movement. The light flickering, but I couldn't really tell what it was. Then it turned its head back and looked straight at me. It was at least six feet tall, if not more. It was dark colored. It had a dog-like appearance, a pointy nose and a really big pointy ears. Courtney dashed into her house and grabbed the flashlight. When she returned outside, she shined it toward the barn door, but the animal was no longer there. She walked closer to the barn to look for tracks in the heavy snow. When she didn't see any, she realized the creature might still be inside, and ran back to the safety of the house. She never saw the creature again. She later talked to the neighbor, who had seen something the size of a buffalo, but the shape of a dog, in the same barn a few months earlier before Courtney's encounter. The neighbor had said she had been so frightened she was in near hysterics for days. Her father had taken his gun and searched the barn, but found nothing there. At the time of these events, Neither of the girls had heard the legend song and did not know about the Michigan Dogman until years later. Water's Meat, 1994. This report comes to us from an anonymous contributor who grew up in Sheboygan County. 
which spent many summers camping on family property in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. The encounter took place in the area of Watersmeet, home of the famous Paulding Lights phenomena. Oddly enough, the Paulding Lights are now known as Dog Meadow Lights. I was 13. I had just gotten new rollerblades for Christmas, and since the main road where our property sits is paved, I couldn't wait to ride around. I went blading myself and stopped to rest for a second. On the road, the woods were thick. There's not much space between the road and the woods in most parts. I remember seeing trees pushed down on the road that my dad said were done by bears. He was an avid bear hunter. I remember not hearing any of your normal sounds of nature, not even birds. The air was still. The sky would be pure dark and not too long. I was deciding to turn back when I heard a rustling behind me, and something emerged from the left side of the road. I assumed it was a deer and paused. It made myself as quiet as I could so I could watch it. it slumped down on my stomach in the middle of the road. It was about 600 feet ahead of me. When I got myself settled onto the road to watch it and looked up, I realized what I was looking at wasn't a deer. It was on all fours. Gray-brown fur. First, I feared the worst. Thinking a bear had caught my scent until I saw that it, it had this outline and color. I thought it was looking like a dog until I realized... The face was too primitive, like a fox or a coyote's. At this point in my life, I had never seen a wolf in real life, and it was too far for me to make out the face exactly. The Michigan Department of National Resources had always recognized that wild wolves still roamed in the Upper Peninsula, although they were thought to be in very limited numbers, and only in extremely remote areas. It is conceivable this witness was seeing one of these wolves, but then... Something very strange happens. It extended its front legs, and in the slowest, longest seconds of my life, stood up on its hind legs and sniffed the air. Walked for about five steps, then got back down on all fours and walked to the other side of the woods. Then it disappeared. I don't remember how long I laid in the middle of the road, staring at the empty space that I saw this thing stand like a human. I remember my jaw hanging down as low as it could, and a pool of drool and the cement under it. It finally clicked in my mind that perhaps... Perhaps I should rollerblade my butt back to camp as quickly as I could. The witness reports that since the creature never stalked or pursued, they slept very little during the rest of the family trip. They never told anyone about what they had seen, fearing they'd be ridiculed. At the time of the sighting, they never heard the legend song and would not until 2004... They moved to Southern California in 2008 and had no interest in camping ever since. Alpena, 2001. My dad and I have a story to tell about our encounters with the dog man. My dad's story took place in the mid 70s. There was this cemetery behind the Alpena High School and a wooded area behind that. There are many trails that run there and in this area is a place called the Sandies, where all the young kids would go and they would party. My dad and two of his buddies were in a canoe in broad daylight, paddling from the Sandies around the back of the cemetery. The bank of the rivers were about 10 to 12 feet high in places, and some trails run right to the edge. The three of them saw what looked to be a big dog running behind them on the trail. They didn't pay much attention to it until they heard a splash. When they looked, it was swimming after them. Then it went from a dog paddle to the chest and front legs coming out of the water and wading after them. They decided right then and there not to wait around and see what it was. Honestly, I thought it was BS at the time, and I'm still not sure even to this day if it was something that they had been smoking or drinking. And then around 2001 to 2002, I was leading some friends through the Sandy's trails. I used to like taking people out there without a flashlight, telling them my dad's story to freak them out. The girls were freaked out before we even got into the woods, so I decided not to scare them that night. In the river are small, several islands connected by a smaller sliver of land. At the time, there were three such islands chained together, and I took them through the last one, which was planted with pines in this nice, even row. I was the first one back there, about 30 seconds ahead, when one of the girls got her foot hung up on something. Now, as I was going back to help her, there was a spot where the trees make a sort of roof effect, which is really cool looking at night. 
with the moon shining through. And at that point, I saw something. I'm not sure what it was, but it sent me running out double time. When my buddy saw my face, he didn't say a word. He just followed, both of us dragging the girls behind us. When he asked me later why I came out in such a hurry, I told him it was because I thought that I had seen something at the other end of the island walking through the trees that was very tall, very not likely human. He may not have believed me, but he never questioned either. I'm still not sure what I saw. It could easily have been that I scared myself with Dad's story and was seeing things, but I know this. I still don't like the dark, and even though I love hunting, I still hate going out before the sun comes up during deer season. Benden, 2007. This sighting report is told secondhand by the brother-in-law of the witness. The witness is a prominent person in the local government, and wishes to remain anonymous. The situation started last Saturday night, around midnight, when he was coming home from a friend's house in Benzania, and taking the back way home to Traverse City. He stated that while traveling down Cinder Road, several miles outside of the town of Benden, he observed a pair of eyes reflecting off his headlights ahead of him. Thinking that it was probably a deer along the side of the road, he began to slow down. As he got closer, however, he stated that the object was much larger and much darker than deer. He said that by this time, he had slowed to around 30 miles per hour and was at that point several hundred feet from the creature, which was still hadn't been moving. As he approached further, he stated that the only way that he could describe the creature was being similar to a very large, dark wolf. However, he observed that this thing wasn't on all fours, but was upright, with his back two legs standing near a road-killed deer. He estimated that the creature stood a little over six feet tall and had very dark fur. He stated that by now... He was going slow enough to bring his truck to a stop in the road and observe the creature, which had not yet moved, still staring at him. He told me that for the briefest of seconds, he believed the object was a giant stuffed animal put there on some kind of joke due to the fact that he had never seen anything like this in his life, and that he was able to drive up on it as close as he was without it moving an inch. He told me, however, that before he could finish that thought, the creature then dropped to all fours and sprinted across the road and disappeared into the woods, on the other side of the road. He told me that he stayed frozen in his seat for a few minutes, wondering, in the middle of the road, what the heck had just happened. And I jokingly asked him if he had been drinking that night, and with a deadly serious face, he stated no. Whatever that was, it was for real. As perplexed as he was that night over what he'd seen, he was deathly afraid to go wandering into the woods to investigate further. He said that in using a flashlight, he observed an animal's tracks leading into the woods on the opposite side of the road, and was fortunate enough that night to have his digital camera with him. He showed me a photograph of the paw print, which he said appeared to be around seven or eight inches long. He had another piece of the same paw print where he placed a shotgun shell in the middle of it for scale. He told me that he was lucky the side of the road was so soft because he wasn't willing to go any further than two or three steps away from the door of his truck to get a picture. I inquired if the animal had made any sound before it disappeared. He said that he didn't hear it make any noise, and were it not for the picture, he would have thought that he had imagined the whole thing. I asked him, could have been a bear. He stated absolutely not. He bear hunts every year in the Upper Peninsula, so he obviously knew what bears looked like up close. That's his story. Believe it if you like. If I didn't know him as well as I did and hadn't seen the pictures, I would have said that he was out of his mind. I've heard the song. I know some of the stories, but I always believed it was just for entertainment value. After this happened, though, looking at all this under a whole new light, Hey there, kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I wanted to tell you all thank you so much for listening to tonight's story, or watching tonight's story if you're on YouTube. If you're not on YouTube, that means you're probably on the podcast that's available on iTunes, 
on the Google Play Store and is now actually available on Spotify and doesn't use as much data. So, hey, that's a thing. If you guys aren't listening on YouTube or Spotify, then I have no idea how else you could have found me. Unless you found one of those books on Amazon. You know, the Creepypasta Collection Volume 1, Volume 2. Those are things too. Oh well. I don't know how you would have heard me there, seeing as this was recorded like two years after those came out. Uh, well, anyway. Thanks for listening, folks. And sweet dreams. <laughs>